Hello students, your professor Dr. Mink. Welcome to another exciting computer org lecture. This is the last topic we're going to be covering in CSC 240 computer organization, and that is the stack, the abstract data structure that we'll be implementing in this class at the machine level. Let's get started. A stack is an abstract data type or data structure that uh, is very important in computing and one that is encountered in many different applications. Uh, three of these applications will describe our interrupt driven IO. This is the rest of the story, okay? When a process interrupts another process, in other words, a higher priority process interrupts a process with a lower priority, the state of the process being interrupted is pushed onto a specific stack. And then when the time comes for it to finish processing, um, meaning all uh, processes with higher priorities that have interrupted after it started, after they all finish, the state of that gets popped off the top of the stack and um, continued uh, processing. We also evaluate arithmetic operations by pushing operands onto the top of a stack and then popping them off and pushing the uh, resultant on the top of the stack. And we also can use a stack for data conversion, data type conversion, two's complement binary to ASCII strings, etc. Here we have some important characteristics of a stack as an abstract data type. Okay, a quick review of the concept of, of abstraction. Um, we extract the essential characteristics and behavior of an object, but disregard any specific implementation details. In other words, we know uh, how to use the object but we don't know how the task it's performed is coded or implemented. Um, an example is a list in an object that stores data in a sequential format. The abstract description says nothing about how it's implemented in code. Okay, so storage objects like lists and stacks and queues are implemented as data structures in a program. And that means it's a memory structure designed to store and retrieve data using specific protocol or rules of that abstract data structure or type, okay? So a list has sequential access. You can always get to any data by going to the beginning of the list and then uh, traversing the list elements until the data element is found. A stack is a data structure that's very useful at the assembly level. And the stack stores and manipulates data using a what's called a protocol or a, the management discipline of the stack. And the protocol, which is the defining characteristic of a stack, is LIFO, which stands for last, I, last in, first out. So the last item pushed, there's a key term, pushed on the stack is the first item to be popped off the stack. Pop is another uh, key term, okay? And you cannot access any of the internal elements. You can only access the item that is on the top of the stack. So a stack as described on the previous slide, is a LIFO storage structure, which means inversely, the first thing you push or put into the stack is the last thing that, that you take out of the stack. Or the last thing you put into the stack is the first thing you take out. And this protocol 
of access is what defines a stack, not how you implement it. And you're going to see in this final topic of the course that there are multiple ways to implement a stack. But what defines the stack is the rules of engagement or the protocol. So the two main operations, terms that are very important, are push, adding an item to the top of the stack, and pop, removing an item or the item from the top of the stack. You can't pop anything off of a stack, anything other than the top item on the stack. And you can only push an item onto the top of the stack. Here we have some everyday examples of a stack, a device that stores specific items using the LIFO protocol. Now, I, I want to preface this by saying these are mechanical stacks where there's actual moving parts. The stack, or often called a physical stack, the stacks that we're going to implement are electronically uh, manipulated. There are no moving parts, but you'll see that um, as we progress. But but I think it's valuable to you know do these comparisons. So uh, you've seen the coin holder on a car. You know it stores quarters in a spring-loaded compartment, and it makes one coin available at a time, which is only the top coin. So at any time, an extracted coin will be the last coin that was added. We can't remove a coin from an empty stack. So when you push when you push a quarter onto the top of the stack, okay, you add it to the stack, and then if you immediately pop or remove the item on the top of the stack, it's the last item that was pushed onto the stack. And a plate dispenser in a cafeteria or a buffet um, works the same way. The plates are stored on a spring-loaded structure. The last plate pushed onto the top of the plate dispenser is uh, the first one that can be popped or removed from that stack. And when the stack is empty, you can't remove any plates from it, obviously. Keeping with the topics discussed on the previous slide, here is a physical stack in multiple states. So starting from left to right, the initial state is an empty stack. Uh, after we push one item, and we can use the dates on the coins to identify different pieces of data. So we push a quarter, a 1995 quarter, onto the stack. And after one push, we have one item on the stack it's that last item pushed, the 1995 quarter, and it is also at the top of the stack. Then we push a 1982 quarter, followed by a 1998 quarter, followed by a 1996 quarter. So the last quarter pushed onto the stack is the 1996 quarter. If we were to pop one element off the stack, the element would be the 1996 quarter. That's the only element, the only piece of data that we have access to. So after one pop, the 1996 has been removed or popped from the stack, and now the top of the stack is the 1998 quarter. We would need three more pops to retrieve the, 19, the initial 1995 quarter that was initially pushed onto the stack when it was empty. As mentioned previously, the stacks that we've depicted so far have all been physical or mechanical stacks, which means the elements or the data items move as new items are pushed and or popped off of the stack. Now, let's take a look at a software implementation where the data items don't move, 
Instead, it's the top of the stack, which is implemented with a pointer moves. So here we have uh, the same basic states that we looked at previously implemented in a software, I'm sorry, a software implementation uh, representing those same states that we just went through in the previous slide. So in this example, let's say the base of the stack or the bottom of the stack is hex 4000, okay? And we would have some code that tells us when the top of the stack pointer, which is held by R6, equals whatever we have stored in the top of stack, which in this case would be X4000, the stack is empty, okay? After one push, okay, we have R6 holds 3FFF, which is one memory location less than or behind hex 4000. So the stack is actually growing negatively, if you will. And we push just an arbitrary value. In this case, it looks like a decimal 18. Not looks like it is a decimal 18. So then after three pushes, right, where we push first a decimal 31, then a decimal 5, and then a decimal 12 on the stack. And what's actually changing is the value in R6, which tells us the value at the top of the stack, not the actual elements. Okay, 18, that decimal 18 that we stored or we pushed onto the empty stack is still stored at 3F, memory location 3FFF. So after two pops, the top of the stack, as held in R6, holds 3FFE. And we say that after two pops, the value at the top of the stack is decimal 31. Now here is a um, concept we've not covered before. That decimal 5 and decimal 12 are still stored in those memory locations that they were before, 3FFC, 3FFD. But they are no longer accessible through the stack. They are there, and if you, you know, use some you know, IT CSI methodology, you might be able to retrieve those. But given the stack, they're no longer accessible. We cannot get to them. And the only thing we can do with 3FFD and 3FFC is to push values on them. But the 5 and the 12 are no longer part of the stack. They will be reused at some point in time when we push elements in those memory locations but we cannot, with the protocol of the stack, in no way can we access that 5 and 12 once they've been popped off the stack. This is a really important concept. Stacks are used extensively in computing. Uh, some examples, arithmetic expression operation uh, when you use postfix notation, which is also called RPN. Now, I had to Google this, not to offend anybody who is Polish, but it is reverse Polish notation, which is what I was taught in college 35 years ago. Um, so yes, RPN, reverse Polish, Polish notation, or postfix notation, where you feed the, um, the arithmetic calculation, the operands first and then you perform the operation on those. They use a stack, special formula evaluation, such as chemical formulas. When you're computing the molecular, molecular weight of calcium nitrate, um, 
by saving the weight of NO3 twice on a stack or on a stack, then doubling it and then uh, adding that weight to, cal to the weight of a calcium atom. Um, function return setup and local variable allocation when uh, in C++ when the main function calls another function and all of the variables in main go out of scope, all of that data is pushed onto a stack. And as the function that main called returns to main, all of the, when it does return to main, all of the data or the state of the machine gets popped off the stack. And it's, it's similar to our use of R7 to save the return address um, of our trap and subroutines. Here we have the basic code to implement the operations push and pop. And for this implementation, the stack grows downwards, okay? So when an item is added, the top of the stack moves closer to zero or, um, well, you'll see. So the first thing we do, remember R6 holds the address of the top of the stack. So to push a new item onto the top of the stack, we place the item in R0, okay? R0 is where the argument goes for this subroutine, if you will. And we decrement R6. Remember, the stack grows downward, so we're subtracting one. So if the top of the stack was hex 4000, we subtract one to get us to 3FFF, and then we store the value at R0 into um, 3FFF, the new value held in R6. So that's a push. Okay. To pop, okay, to pop the top item off of the stack, the the result or return value gets stored in R0. So we have an LDR load register. We load the value stored uh, stored at the address in R6 into R0. And then we move the stack pointer. Now we say we decrement the stack pointer, but we're actually adding one, because remember the stack grows negatively or downward, okay? We're now introducing two new terms to the stack protocol. And they are overflow and underflow errors, okay? An overflow error occurs when we attempt to push an item on a stack that is full, that is at capacity. And later we'll show you how we implement a stack and designate its capacity. But stacks do have a capacity. And in this particular case, we, one, two, three, four, it looks like we have a stack with a capacity of five elements. So to, if we try to implement push on a stack that is full, we get what's called overflow. The other end of the spectrum, if we try to pop an element off a stack that is empty, we get what's called underflow. And we're going to show you, I'm going to show you how to implement overflow and underflow error detection in your push and pop routines. First, we'll look at pop with underflow detection implemented. So there's a lot of moving parts of this one. So let's, uh, Try to pay attention. So when underflow occurs, we use register five to report success or failure. 
zero is success, and one is underflow error reported in R5. So we have, and this is the assembly code, we have um, a variable labeled as empty, and we use fill, and that is the hexadecimal equivalent of, it's a negative of hex 4000, and you'll see why in a second. So we load R1, we load the value at empty into R1. And then we add the top of the stack pointer, R6 plus R1, and store it in R2 just to set the condition code. Okay, if that is zero, that means that R6 was pointing to hex 4000. Because remember, we're adding a negative 4000 to it. The only way we get any value other than zero is if it doesn't point to that address. So if it's zero, that means that we're trying to pop an element off a stack where the top of the stack pointer is pointing at the base. It's empty. So BRZ takes us to fail. We um, zero R5 and R5, R5, zero. And then we add one to R5. And remember, R5 is one for an underflow error, zero for success. And then we return. If the top of the stack pointer does not equal hex 4000, okay? We don't take that BRZ fail, and we have the rest of our pop plus we um, zero R5, indicating that we had success and we have a return. Here we have the push routine implemented with overflow error detection. And just to refresh your memory, uh, overflow condition occurs when we try to push an element onto a stack that is full. Okay, so we check for underflow by checking the top of the stack before we add any data. And once again, we use R5 to report underflow as one. R5 gets or gets assigned the value one. Uh, if we have overflow, which means it failed, and then zero if we have success. So, and it's implemented as a subroutine. So here we have, first thing we do is we load R1 with a value that's labeled max. And max is the negative of the top of the stack. Okay, in this case, the stack runs from hex 4000 to 3FFB. Remember, the stack grows negatively. I did say there was a lot of moving parts here. So what we do is we add the value in R1 to R6 and store it in R2 just to set the condition code. Now, if R6 minus R or plus the negative value in R1 is zero. That means that the top of the stack pointer is pointing to the maximum value or the maximum memory look, the, the largest, the top of the stack, let's just say that the capacity of the stack. And so then we hit the BRZ that will be executed. We go to fail. We and R5 with zero and we add one to it and we hit our return. So we don't push the item onto the top of the stack, we simply return with error detection, overflow error detection in the, in the form of R5 equaling zero. If R6 is not equal to 3FFB, the BRZ fail is not executed, the branch is not executed, and we simply, we subtract one from R6, in other words, move the top of the stack pointer. 
we move the value in R0 at the address. We store the value at R0 at the address specified in R6 with the zero offset, and we zero R5, and then we did our return. So we either push, set R5 to zero, return, or we fail, set R5 to one, and return. Now we're ready to finish our explanation of the interrupt driven IO mechanism. Interrupts were introduced in chapter eight when we covered IO, but we never finished uh, the conversation. We put it on hold until we understood how a, how, a, how a stack was implemented. So an external device signals a need to be serviced with a priority level. If the priority level of the, um, the process to be serviced is higher than the priority level of the process being serviced, okay, the interrupt is accepted. And the processor saves the state of the current process. And then it pushes that state onto the top of a stack, okay? And then when the interrupting process finishes, the process that was interrupted, <laughs> it's a lot of moving parts on this one, is restored by being popped off the top of the stack, the program counter, all the registers, all that good stuff. And that constitutes the state of the processor. So obviously interrupts happened very quickly without warning. And so the two questions hardware and software system developers had to ask themselves, how do we save enough information about the current program being processed to be able to pick up where we left off after serving the higher priority interrupt? And how do we reset the CPU to deal with the interrupt service routine? In both cases, the answer requires the use of a stack. Now, remember our discussion on the finite state machine that moves from one finite state to the next? So we are going to take the state, all of the elements of the state of the process being interrupted and push them on the top of a stack until which time we wanna resume that process. Now, let me just say Interrupts are happening all the time. And although this sounds awkward because of the speed of uh, processors today, it really isn't awkward. So let's just say a priority level one process is being handled by the processor and it's interrupted by a priority level two process. It gets pushed onto the top of the stack and the priority level two process is than being handled by the CPU. But what if before the priority level two process finishes, it's interrupted by a priority level three process? Well, you can imagine it gets pushed to the top of the stack. So then the priority level two process is on the top of the stack and the priority level one process, the state of the priority level one process is beneath it on the stack. And what can we get off the stack? Just the top item. So this could go on multiple levels. The three could be interrupted by a four, the four could, et cetera. So let's decompose this. Let's say the priority level three process finishes, okay? When it finishes, we pop the state of the priority level two process. Remember the finite state machine, we pop that off the top of the stack and we resume processing that. Now, even before that ends, that could be interrupted by a three, a four, a five, a six, but let's just say it doesn't and it finishes. When it finishes, we pop the priority level one process off the stack and it continues until it finishes or it's interrupted by an item, by a process with a higher priority level. So, 
what state information is needed to completely capture the state of a running process. Let's go through um, some of this now, and we're going to flow into the next slide in this discussion on capturing the state of a running process. So we've got the privilege level in bit 15. Okay, supervisor, if it's a supervisor, um, privilege, privilege level it's zero. If it's user, it's one. And we'll get to that in a second. The priority level is bits 10, 9, and 8. And we have eight priority levels, zero through seven. And we got the NZP codes in bits zero, one, and two. And we also have the program counter and all temporary state of the processes not stored in memory in the registers. I'm coming. So just like subroutines, trap routines, etc., we only need to see, save the program counter and the PSR, and we'll assume that the interrupt service routines um, are implemented in a way that they save all the relevant, reg relevant registers, which is the callee saved protocol we discussed um, when we got into um, subroutines and trap routines. The program counter and the PSR between them hold enough state information to be able to reconstitute the program when needed. So where do we save them? We save them on a stack. Can we have nested interrupts? We absolutely positively can. You can have multiple processes stacked, no pun intended, stacked or pushed onto a stack. And the lowest priority item will be at the bottom of the stack and the highest priority item will be at the top of the stack. So we've already determined that the interrupt service routine will save or should save, must save, let's say, the register contents. So where do we save the processor state? Okay, we don't know um, when an interrupt may occur, so you can't prepare by saving the registers. Okay, we have to assume that the interrupt, interrupt service routine will save any registers. So, and when we resume, we need to restore the state exactly as it was. So we must save the state before we invoke the service routine. And we don't know where, so, and another consideration is that an interrupt service routine might also get interrupted by a higher priority service routine. And thus they may be nested. So we're gonna use a stack. We're gonna use a supervisor stack that is hardwired and we will push the state to save it. And when it needs to be restored, we will pop it off the stack. The supervisor stack is stored in a special region of memory. It's part of the operating system, if you will. And there are two locations um, save.ssp, which is used to serve to save the supervisor stack pointer, and also another register or memory location used to store the user stack pointer, which is US, save.usp. Uh, they're labels. And we still want to use R6 as a stack pointer so that our push pop routines will work. So when we switch from user mode to supervisor mode, we save R6 to saved.usp and vice versa, switching from supervisor mode to user mode. In this slide, we have the most detailed map of the LC3's memory that we've seen so far. And you could see 0000, 000 to 00FF is the trap vector table. Those are the addresses of the starting points of each one of our um, trap routines. We have our exception vector table, 
which are starting points of exception routines. And then we have at hex 0180 to 01FF, we have our interrupt vector table um, that has the addresses handling all of the interrupts. And then we have from 0200 to 2 FFF, the uh, last section of um, system memory or operating system, if you will. We have the operating system and the supervisor stack is in that location. And then, of course, we have starting at hex 300, 3000, sorry, <laughs> uh, our user program area up to FDFF. And then we have our um, IO device registers at the end of memory. You should take note that the interrupt handler needs its own processor status register, program counter, and stack pointer. So, you know, you should be asking where do we put all of the interrupted codes, say, state while we take an interrupt? Well, we have a new stack called the supervisor stack. We put all these variables on the supervisor stack. The PSR, the PC, and the SP get placed there automatically. And the general purpose registers can be put there by the interrupt handler, the program actually interrupting uh, the, code, the code that's being um, put on the stack. Okay, the system uh, does not put the state on the user stack that would be a mistake. The system stack is not accessible to user programs. It's only accessible to system programs. Here are the steps involved in invoking a system service routine. Okay, so if the privilege level is currently one, which is user level, um, R6 gets saved into um, the memory location save.usp um, user stack pointer. Then um, the value in save.ssp, right, system stack pointer, gets loaded into R6. Uh, we push the PSR and the PC onto the supervisor stack. We set the um, processor status register PSR bit 15 to zero, meaning we're now in supervisor or privilege mode. We set the three bits of um, the PSR 10 uh, bits, eight, nine, and 10 uh, to the priority level of the interrupt being serviced, okay? And we set the PSR to zero. And then the memory address register goes to X01VV, where VV is the 8-bit interrupt vector provided by the interrupting device. So for example, um, the keyboard is hex 80, which actually is an 8-bit code in, in, in binary. We load the memory location into the M01VV, whatever that 8-bit vector interrupt vector is into the memory data register. And then we set the program counter to the memory, the value in the memory data register, which is the first instruction of the internet serv in interrupt service routine that gets fetched. And just like a subroutine, it's then handled until which time it terminates naturally or, or what? Or it gets interrupted by a service routine with a higher priority. And then it gets pushed onto the top of the stack and we have nested interrupts. So like we have a return, which is a jump R7 for our subroutines and our trap routines, we have a special instruction return from interrupt, okay, that restores the state. So we pop the program counter from the supervisor stack we pop the, pop the PSR from the supervisor stack. And if PSR bit 15 is one, we take the um, saved user stack pointer and we store it in R6. That's if we're going back to user mode. 
And RTI, you should know, is a privilege instruction. It can only be executed while in supervisor mode. So you cannot access this instruction in user mode. If you did, you'd cause an exception, or if you tried to, you'd cause an exception. And we'll get to that uh, in a few minutes. Now we're going to begin a six slide sequence that walks you through the steps, the sequence of steps that happens when uh, a device interrupts. So in this example, at the very beginning of this example, we're executing an add instruction at hex 3006, and it is interrupted by device B. So in this example, we store our six into the save.user stack pointer. And then R6 gets the value from the system supervisor stack pointer, which is in save.ssp, which is just simply a label, um, a memory address. So then we push the PSR and the program counter onto the stack, and then we transfer to device B service routine, which begins at hex, in this example, begins at hex 6200. And you could see that this service routine for device B, whatever that is, ends at hex 6210. But we're not there yet. So in this example, device B gets interrupted when it's executing an AND at 6202. So it's about, I don't know, 20% complete. And it's interrupted by a higher priority level interrupt or service routine. So in order to do this, in order for device C to interrupt B, we push the PSR and the PC for device B onto a stack, and then we're going to transfer to device C service routine, which happens to start in this example at 6300. And you can see on the left hand side, the program counter is now at 6300, and you can see the supervisor stack that has on the top the state for device B's interrupt service routine. And then it has the state of A, which was the original program that device B interrupted. In this example, the interrupt service routine for device C is allowed to end naturally. In other words, it's not interrupted. It runs to fruition and it hits the RTI. And when it hits the RTI, it pops the program counter and the PSR from the stack, which was the state reconstitution for device B. And that takes us right back to 6203. And uh, we're back in into device B, the interrupt service routine for device B at the end of this slide. So then, in this example, the interrupt service routine for device B is not interrupted and is allowed to uh, run to completion. So it hits its RTI return from interrupt. And uh, then we pop the PSR and the PC from the stack. We restore R6 and we continue program A at hex 3007 as if nothing had happened. Now, I know this sounds very awkward, right? But remember how fast the processor is running. So this happens, and it happens seamlessly. It's, it's as though uh, it happens instantaneously. 
So I told you we would get to exception handling, which is an inter internal interrupt. It's when something unexpected happens inside the processor in supervisor mode. So such an, you know, it's when a privilege operation um, executes an, or experiences an error, okay? Executing an illegal opcode, divide by zero is another exception, accessing an illegal address, okay? And these are all handled just like an interrupt, okay? Except the vector is determined internally by the type of exception and it's stored in that exception vector table. Next, we look at arithmetic using a stack. And this is the uh, RPN, reverse Polish notation. And instead of using registers, some ISAs use a stack for the source and destination operations, um, also referred to as a zero address machine. So an example would be the add instruction popping two numbers from the stack, add them, and then push the result to the stack, thus requiring zero registers to add two numbers. So if we evaluate A plus B times C plus D using a stack, okay, we're going to push A, we're going to push B, and then we're going to add. Remember, add will pop A, pop B, add them, and then push, right, the result onto the um, top. Then we would push C, push D, add, right? So at this point in time, we have the sum of A plus B, and on top of that, we've got C and D, and then after the push, I'm sorry, after the add, they're popped off, and so we have at the top of the stack, the sum of C plus D, and right below it, the sum of A plus B. And then we simply execute multiply. And multiply would pop the last two, the top two values off the stack, multiply them and push the value back on the stack. And we simply pop the result and, and we would, I'm assuming we would then display it for the user. In this slide, we see a full flow chart for the op add subroutine, which uses a stack and it pops the top two values off of the stack. It detects whether or not it was successful each time. So you'll see it starts, it pops, if it's okay, it pops, if it's okay, then it adds the range is okay, then it pushes. Um, so um, you're gonna see the actual code for the op add subroutine in the next slide. In this week's module on the LMS, I'll be posting a fully implemented and rather complex program called the calculator. Here, we have the subroutine called op add, which is a, um, an add routine, which adds two values uh, using a stack. And it assumes that the two values to be added, operand one and operand two, are the top two elements on the stack. This is fully implemented within the calculator. I'd like you to take a look at it. It is very well documented. And um, I mean, I could go through it now. You know, we pop, we get the first operand, which will be an R0. We check to make sure, remember, R5 is error detection for the pop and push routines. And if R5 is anything but zero, we exit. We move the value to R1. So now we have operand one into R1. We pop another value off. We use R5 to check for pop success. And 
Then finally, we compute the sum by adding the value operand one, which is an R1 to R0, storing it back into R0. We check the size of it. Um, we got a subroutine called range check. And so if there's an error, we restore and bail. If not, we push the value in R0, the sum back onto the stack, and we return. Data type conversion is another application for using a stack. Remember, the keyboard input routines read ASCII characters, not binary values. So, and similarly, those output routines are looking for an ASCII or, or write an ASCII value to uh, the output device. So here's a program um, that solicits two inputs, two values from the user, two single keys. And let's say the user inputs two and three. Well, what happens? Well, the ASCII two is a hex 32 plus the ASCII three, character three, is hex 33. And that, when added together, adds to a hex 65. Okay? 65 is a lowercase z. So in this case, you know, 2 plus 3, ASCII 2 plus ASCII 3 is going to output an ASCII e, lowercase e. So obviously, um, we would use, we would need some help. <laughs> we would need some conversion. So if we solicit a multi-digit decimal number from the user, uh, remember, we've just read three ASCII digits, okay? And so if the user types two followed by a five followed by a nine, which we assume wanted, the user wanted that to be interpreted as 259 decimal number. You actually have an ASCII hex 32 next to a, or then a hex 35 and then a hex 39. So how do we convert this um, to a number, uh, an integer? So first, we convert the first character, the two, uh, to a digit. So we sub subtract hex 30 to get its magnitude away from zero, and then we multiply by 100. Then we convert the second character to a digit, subtract hex 30, multiply it by 10. Then convert the third character to a digit, subtract hex 30, right? And then we add the three digits together, the, the hundreds, the tens, and the ones. So how do we multiply a number by 100? Well, we can add the number to itself 100 times, or we can add 100 to itself x number of times, x being the number. And this works better if the number is less than 100. So since we have a small range of numbers, 0 through 9, we can use the number as an index into a lookup table. And the next few slides are going to show you how to use a lookup table um, to handle these kinds of um, arithmetic operations. Here's our first view of a lookup table. And this would be for the hundreds digit. Now, rather than walk you through the next three or four slides, step by step, I'm going to post a push pop program and also the calculator in this week's module in Canvas. And these are fully implemented subroutines and lookup tables within that program. And I'll walk you through, I'll post another video in which we actually use the calculator and we stop and take a look at memory at various states. So the next three slides are the complete conversion routine for a three digit um, input, ASCII input into a full decimal number stored in a uh, memory address. I'm not going to walk you through step by step. I would like you to just step through these next three slides, take a look at them, and um, 
then when we finish this and we're very close to the end of this video lecture when we finish this go to the module and you'll see all the resources that i'm referring to as i mentioned the next three slides are simple no i'm sure they're not simple they're the program instructions that convert a three-digit number from ASCII to binary. I'm not going to um, walk you through the code here because I'm going to have um, an instructional video. We're actually going to use this and we will um, stop the machine, take a memory uh, snapshot, look at that memory and see where things are going, how things are going and what's happening with the state of the machine. So I'm just going to leave a long pause so that you can take a look at these three slides and I'll leave the soundtrack across the three slides. And then uh, I think we only have a few slides left, maybe three or four, um, which cover binary to ASCII conversion. And then after that, I'm going to ask you to go right to the module and take a look at the push pop program and the uh, full blown calculator to see the implementation of these um, data type conversions from ASCII to binary and binary back to ASCII. Okay, we're almost done. Um, the last thing we're going to cover in this um, lecture is the opposite of ASCII to binary conversion converting a two's complement binary value to a three digit, de digit decimal number. And this would be done in preparation for output. Okay, so instead of multiplying, we need to divide by 100 to get the hundreds digits. So, um, so we just subtract 100 repeatedly from the number to divide. And as I mentioned, um, the next uh, three slides, which are the last three slides of the uh, presentation uh, walk you through the code for binary to ASCII conversion and um, we'll take a look at that next but like I said they're going to be implemented in a um, push pop program and also in the full-blown calculator and I'll have a separate instructional video that walks you through that so as promised this is the first slide of three slides containing the binary to ASCII conversion code uh, instead of uh, forcing you to sit there for I think believe it was 90 seconds was the timing of those other three I'm going to simply ask you to click through the last two uh, slides in this presentation and of course thanks for watching if you have any questions um, you know how to get a hold of me please don't hesitate for a moment to ask me Okay, thanks for watching and have a great day.